us uh, as we focus on the Lord God. Well, we're going to get right into the preaching this morning, and uh, so if you'll take your Bible, uh, would you turn with me to the book of Zephaniah? Zephaniah, find your way there in the scripture this morning. We've been doing, uh, we had been uh, going over the Bible study notes on the Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night Bible studies. And, of course, the summer schedule is different, so we're not doing that right now, but the notes are still available to you. Uh, there were some at the front door, or if you call that the back door, I don't know what that door is. Uh, but anyway, there were some there for you as, uh, as you came in, and if you'd like to use those, that's just fine. They're also available on the website. I will endeavor uh, to keep those notes going for your uh, help and benefit uh, all the way through the summer here as well. Zephaniah chapter number 2. Last time we uh, read the first three verses where Zephaniah transitioned into uh, a call to repentance and a call to make decisions uh, based on the, the, uh, the fact of the coming judgment. And so we saw that in the first three verses there of Zephaniah chapter 2. We continue now with verses 4 through 7 this morning. And so if you'll look down, I'll read from the scripture here, verse number 4 in Zephaniah chapter 2. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Ketherites, the word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. And the sea coast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah, and they shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon, shall they lie down in the evening. For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. Let's go ahead and pray, and, uh, and then we'll jump into each of these verses. Our Father, we pray that uh, in these moments now, as we study the Word of God, that You would uh, touch our hearts, that You would encourage us where we need that encouragement that you would show us clearly where we need repentance and where we need conviction, and that your Holy Spirit would guide this time right here, that I would get out of the way, and that your words would speak forth truth to all of us. Lord, we pray that you would uh, meet us now in these moments, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, here in uh, the next couple of verses, uh, Zephaniah just jumps right into messages of judgment for, the, uh, for other nations. Now, the first chapter here, Zephaniah was focusing on Israel and on Judah, focusing on their problems and, and showing them that they were uh, they were worthy of the judgment of God. And so uh, Zephaniah just kind of thundered it out there on, on the, uh, the nation of Judah and Israel. But now, it seems like with hardly any transition at all, after Zephaniah calls the children of Israel to repentance, then he launches right on into more declarations of judgment now on other nations. And so... Uh, we'll, we'll see several other nations here that uh, are highlighted by Zephaniah. And God's judgment uh, will, will fall on those nations just as much as it would fall on his own people. And I think that's important for us to understand that God is the judge of all, no matter what they believe. Uh, whether they fear God or not. He is the judge over all nations. And we have this tendency today in our, in our mindset to think that, uh, well, Christians have their religion, 
and Muslims have their religion, and Hindus have their religions, and, uh, and uh, Buddhists have all of their... And, and we kind of think to ourselves, well, everybody's got their own thing, and that's just fine. No, it's not. And someday, every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess and so it is important for us to recognize that no matter what they believe, God is still their judge. And he makes it clear in this passage as well. Uh, he, he thunders out against four cities, and, uh, and the, the cities of what would be the Philistines here, uh, and we'll see that a little bit later on. You remember the Philistines. Oh boy, the, the great enemy of the Israelites, especially in, uh, in the days of the judges, in the days of the first king of Israel, Saul, and in the days of David. Uh, remember, it was, it was little David that brought down the Philistine, the giant Goliath. And, and so this great enemy against the, uh, the Israelites is now going to be judged by God. And you know, I think it's important to point out that you don't stand against Israel and against God's people and get away with it. You just don't. And, and I think every nation is on dangerous ground, even in this day of grace. I think people are on dangerous ground when they oppose the nation of Israel. And I just have to say, and, and I don't want to get political, but I'm thankful for uh, the the stand that our president has taken uh, in support of the nation of Israel, the first president to recognize Jerusalem truly as the capital of Israel. And I, I thank God for that. And I think, it, in my personal opinion, and we can have discussions sometime on this, I suppose, but uh, he, has, he has brought us into a place where we are no longer uh, as... Uh, prone to the judgment of God. Now, I'm not saying we're in a good spot, but I'm saying that he's made a wise choice in choosing to recognize Jerusalem and support Israel. Every nation that turns against Israel will be judged for it, and there may come a day when our nation turns against Israel, and we will be judged for it as well. And so it's, I think it's important for us to recognize that even in this day of grace. There's coming a time when the focus will once again be on the nation of Israel. God's program right now is His church, where there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither male nor female, the Bible says, in this day of grace. In other words, our relationship with God is special and unique, and the church is a special new creation. It's a special thing. And so we're living in that time right now. But, but there is coming a time when the focus will once again be on Israel, and, uh, and we would do well to be mindful of that even in this day of grace. So here Zephaniah begins to thunder out against these four cities. Notice in verse 4, For Gaza shall be forsaken. Uh, that may remind you of even modern days. The Gaza Strip, right? That, well, th that's the same place. The same place, same city. And, and all of the, the fighting that is going on right now between Israel and the Gaza Strip, you know, and, and other Palestinians as well. But wow, this, is, this really kind of brings it home to see that even at that time, God said, oh, well, I'm going to bring judgment on that city. Notice the kind of judgment. It's going to be forsaken. Well, it's very populated right now. But it won't always be. And that right there tells me that what we're looking at here, the judgment described in these verses, must indeed be future. They've got to be future. That's my thought on that. Uh, Gaza shall be forsaken. Ashkelon, a desolation. Ashkelon is still populated today. It's got a different name, uh, but it's still populated today. Ashdod. Uh, notice, they shall drive out Ashdod, at the noonday, 
Uh, that seems to be populated today pretty well. Uh, and the judgment here, it seems that uh, it's going to be so severe that it's not even going to take the enemies an entire day to do it. <laughs> he says, at noonday, they're going to be uh, destroyed. And they'll have half a day left to do something else. That's the, the idea there. Ekron shall be rooted up. Now, Ekron seemed to be, uh, right now at least, a very small village. Not a whole lot going on there, um, but uh, still populated. And so these four cities, there's a fifth city that's not mentioned here in Zephaniah, uh, but, uh, but there, are, uh, there are other cities as well. Um, but these four are mentioned specifically for this judgment. Uh, it could be, perhaps, uh, that the other cities had already been uh, facing the judgment of God and hadn't even recovered yet. Uh, but he continues on. These four cities, he's... he's uh, Highlighted for this special destruction, verse 5, Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, a nation of the Ketherites, the word of the Lord is against you. Let me stop right there. Uh, this is the cities of the sea coast. The best we can figure out from archaeology and from what the Bible describes, it seems like the Philistines came from the island of Crete, which the Ketherites would seem to hint towards that as well. And, uh, and that's not necessarily settled, but there's a very good case for that, that that's where they came from. Uh, and so that land was not given to them. I think that's important to, to note. Uh, but they migrated from an island. That's why they inhabited the sea coasts. They set up towns along the sea coast. There was, there was a lot of history of, uh, of their battling against even the, the nation of Egypt and certainly against the Israelites there that were in the, the land of Canaan. And so these inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Ketherites, the word of the Lord is against you. Now we might think to ourselves, well, that's not fair. You know, these people are just trying to make a living, you know. They're just trying to do something, and maybe they don't know the God of the Bible. And, and how, how is it fair that, that God could judge them if maybe they don't even know any better? But friend, that's not the case. They should have known. They should have known. It, let's, let's look back at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 6. Keep a finger here because we're coming back. But 1 Samuel chapter 6. In the days of King Saul, they were battling with the nation of Israel. It got so bad, uh, actually this is before uh, King Saul, in the days of Samuel, uh, it got so bad that the, the Philistines actually uh, won in an incredible battle and they stole the Ark of the Covenant. Not good. Not good. Uh, God was so displeased with his own people, he let it happen. That's a whole other message. Uh, but, but they steal the Ark of the Covenant. Well, they set up the Ark of the Covenant. You might remember this. They, they take it to the, the house of their god, Dagon. And the Ark of the Covenant is there, and Dagon, this great big statue, is there as well. And they come in the next morning, and the idol, Dagon, has fallen down flat before the Ark of the Covenant. And that kind of troubles them a little bit. So they, uh, they set him back in trouble standing on his own. And so they set the idol back up again. The next day they come in, and there he is, flat on his face again. I think it happens a third time, and his hands are broken off, and his head's broken off. And, uh, and it seems to be a sign that the Philistine gods, which are no gods, are certainly no match for the one true God, Jehovah. Well, they get nervous about this, and they figure, well, this is, this is a problem. Let's get rid of the Ark of the Covenant. So they start moving it around to different Philistine towns. No, you take it. No, no you take it. And nobody really wants it anymore, because everywhere the Ark of the Covenant goes, there is, uh, there is horrible judgments and disease uh, that comes and breaks out in the lives of all these Philistines. And so they come up with a plan. 1 Samuel chapter 6, look with me at verse number 7. <clears throat> Here's their plan. 
Now therefore make a new cart and take two milk kine on which there hath, not, uh, there hath come no yoke and tie the kine or the cows, the cattle, to the cart and bring their calves home from them. So they've just had calves, separate them from their calves. They've never been yoked together to pull anything, but put this yoke on them and attach the cart to them. Take the calves away from them. Verse 8, And take the, the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which you return him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he, that, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand, speaking of Jehovah God, that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And so they make this plan. All right. Let's work everything against normal odds. Okay? These two mother cows take their calves away from them uh, and, and yoke them together having never pulled anything before, and see if they'll pull this in that direction specifically. And if that happens, then we know that it's truly their God. If that doesn't happen, which is most likely the case, then we'll know that this was just random chance, and at least we're, uh, we're cleared from the, the plagues that will come because of this, uh, this Ark of the Covenant. So that's their plan. They hitch the team up, and what happens? Verse 10, the men did so, took the two milk kind, tied them to the cart, shut up their calves at home, and they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart and the coffer with their mice of gold and images of their emeralds. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand nor to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. They watched the whole thing. They're thinking, well, this can't happen. How is this possible? They had already made the decision. If that happens, and they knew it wouldn't, right? If that happens, then it truly is the God of the Hebrews. They worked everything against them, and sure enough, God makes it happen supernaturally just as exactly as, uh, as what they thought would not happen. Skip ahead to verse 25, uh, or I'm sorry, verse 16 rather. Verse 16. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. And these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord for Ashdod, one. For Geza, one. For Ashkelon, one. For Gath, one. For Ekron, one. They list out the towns. They list out the lords of the Philistines. This is the evidence right there. They should have known. In fact, they did know. But because of their rebellion against what was clearly seen and against the God of the Bible, they decided to turn in rebellion against Him. And for this reason, and many others, according to Amos, uh, one of the reasons was because of their, uh, their making slaves of God's people. Uh, and there are other reasons as well. But certainly... The Philistines knew who God was. And there was no excuse. They should have known. And those five towns, four of them mentioned here in Zephaniah, they should have known. They should have known. You know, we have a tendency to think, well, what about all those people all around the world? And they don't know about Jesus. They've never heard his name. They don't know about the God of the Bible. No, friend, according to Romans, there's no excuse. They have the witness of the creation around them. And if they wanted to know God, then God would have revealed Himself to them. That's the fact. Read it. It's in Romans chapter 1 and 2. But you know what? People reject what revelation they do have of God. And they say, no, this couldn't be a creator. This has got to be evolution that does it. 
And they turn him off. And as a result, God's not going to give them any more light. God's not going to reveal himself any more to them because what he did reveal to them, they didn't want anyway. They are guilty before God. Every sinner, every person that has ever lived on the planet, if in every country, in every nation, every tribe, they are guilty before God. And as much as we don't like thinking about that, that is what the Bible reveals to us about our God. And it is not in our place to design a God of our choosing. That's what he says, and that's who he is. And so here he proves it by meeting out judgment even on the Philistines. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, verse 5. The nation of the Ketherites, the word of the Lord is against you. That is a position you do not want to be in when the word of the Lord is against you. You know, we will be judged by the word of the Lord. He'll take out the word and he'll say, I told you it was right there. And you won't be able to say, well, I just didn't know. I couldn't. I didn't do my Bible reading that day. It's not fair, God. No. And how many Bibles do we even have in our own homes? God will use His Word to judge His people and judge the nations. And when you find that the Word of, a God, of, the, word of the Lord is against you, it's time to change course. One of the principles, in fact, in fact principle number one in the RU program is this. If God's against it, so am I. If God's against it, so am I. What God reveals in His Word, when He says He's against something, I'm going to be against that too because I don't want to be found with the Word of the Lord against me. If God's against it, so am I. That's the wise choice to make. And Zephaniah points it out here. Uh, and, and that is why it is so important for us to take the Bible and give it to people. I praise God for the ministry of the Gideons. I thank God for, for missionaries who are taking the Bible and translating it into the heart language of the people and giving them the word because this is how they know truth. And they've got to have it. Praise God for people that devote their lives to the ministry of of the Word, and giving the Word to others. This is what we need. Because the Word of the Lord is against some things. The Word of the Lord is against people. Here, the Word of the Lord was against the Philistines. O Canaan, the land of the Philistines, I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. It doesn't seem that that's happened yet, but I believe it will. Verse number 6, the seacoast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. Another detail about this coming judgment, it's going to be so severe that the only people who are going to want to live in the cities of, of Gaza and Ashkelon and, and Ashdod, uh, the only ones that are going to want to live there are just the people who are camping out for the sake of taking care of their flocks and shepherds, you know, the shepherds. Uh, they aren't going to want to just live there. Are just camping out. That seems to be the, uh, the severity of this judgment. And I believe we can take that literally. Do you know the Bible talks about how even the topography of the, of the nation of Israel is going to change? It's going to be different over there. It's going to be really different over there. Things do not just continue as they are today. And, uh, and so things are going to change over there. There's judgment coming to these Philistine cities there will be no inhabitant. What's, what's going to be the, the purpose of these places? Verse 7. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon. Shall they lie down in the evening? For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. God will give the land of Gaza and Ashkelon, and Ashdod, and Ekron, back to Israel. That's what that says. When God's judgment comes, in the day that God visits His people, which is the, the time when Jesus returns 
And the Bible says of the, of the Israelites and the Jewish people that they will look on him whom they have pierced. They will receive Jesus as their Messiah. And at that point, God gives the land back. No matter what the peace plan is, set up by all the different presidents and all the different world leaders, dividing up the land of Israel, no matter what peace plan they come up with, there will be no peace until God gives all the land to the nation of Israel. I believe that with my whole heart, because the Bible teaches it. You see, it'll be the Israelites, it'll be the Jewish nation that will benefit from these cities. And they'll take their flocks and they'll use it for their farming purposes. That's what God's going to do someday. And you say, well, that's not fair to those poor Palestinians. Didn't we just talk about this? <laughs> God is fair and just in everything that he does. I'll tell you what's not fair is that I'm alive today and not burning in hell. That's not fair. But because of the grace of God, because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I am here. And I praise God for it. And so, yes, this judgment will come. And it will benefit the remnant. You see that in verse 7? The coast shall be for the remnant of of the house of Judah. And here, this is the first time we see this word in this uh, book here. Remnant. Remnant. There's something special about Israel. There's always a remnant. There's always a leftover group that still believes in the God of the Bible. And there will be a leftover group. You've heard of remnant before. Right? If, uh, if you want a good deal and you're looking for carpet, you get carpet remnants. You get the leftovers, right? You get a good deal. Well, it, that's the idea with the nation of Israel. They, they have been going headlong after their own God of their own making, but there is a leftover group that believes in the God of the Bible. And there will come a time when the Bible even says all Israel shall be saved, and that refers to that last remnant, the leftovers, that finally look to Jesus and receive Him as their Savior and as their Messiah. I want to just look at two passages that talk about the remnant here. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. And I know in your notes I have Isaiah chapter 10, and that's another great passage, and take some time to look there. But I want you to look with me at Isaiah chapter 11 now, and uh, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. Isaiah is prophesying here the time when Jesus would return, Gentiles would be saved. We're seeing that even now. Uh, but I think this has its focus primarily on the millennial reign of Jesus, when Gentiles will seek after the Lord, they'll go to Jerusalem to worship God. Look at verse 10. In that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. Who's that? That's Jesus. The root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of His people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. All these places that the children of Israel had been scattered to he says, I'm bringing them back. The leftovers, the remnant will come back to the land. Verse 12, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not uh, envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, and they shall spoil them in the east together. 
they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. This is talking about something in the future yet here. And it mentions the Philistines. Isn't that interesting? Just as what we were reading in the book of Zephaniah, in the future, God will give the land of the Philistines to Judah and to the Israelites. We see it right there. And who gets, who's the beneficiary? It's the remnant, just as he says right there in that passage. Well, who is the remnant? Look with me at Romans chapter 11 now. Romans chapter 11, where we see more detail about the remnant. Romans chapter 11. And I'm checking the time here. Got a couple minutes left. Look at this passage now. Romans chapter 11. I want you to uh, start here with me in verse number 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not that the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God to him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There are some even now that are a remnant, those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to fast forward now. Look ahead to verse 25 in the same chapter. Uh, this chapter, uh, Paul talks about uh, this, this incredible illustration of a, of a tree and how the, the Israelites were broken off and, and the Gentiles, the church, was grafted in. And then he talks about how the Israelites are going to be grafted back in again. They're coming back, he says. Verse number 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery... In other words, this, this was not clearly seen in Old Testament prophecies. It wasn't clearly seen, but it's clearly seen now. This mystery has been revealed. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so, all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so... Have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also shall obtain mercy? For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth and riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. This is amazing. The wisdom of God. We didn't see it in the Old Testament prophecies very clearly. We couldn't see it very clearly then, but here's the fact. God declared everybody a sinner, including the nation of Israel. The Jews are sinners just like you and I are. They're sinners condemned to hell. Why did God condemn them in that way? So that he could have mercy upon all, so that everybody could be saved and have that opportunity. Even the Jews, there's a remnant and when God has put away iniquity, as it says there, ungodliness from Israel in verse 26, and he takes away their sins in verse 27, that is through the work of Jesus Christ. That is when Jesus comes back. They receive him as their Messiah. They become saved. And just as you and I, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you are declared righteous, so they as well will be declared righteous. And as a nation they'll be saved because they'll turn to him. 